I must have locked up probably close to 70 or 80 auto break-ins. It was like going to Las Vegas or a casino and throwing dimes in a slot machine. You're just punching plates, punching plates. This doesn't look right, that doesn't look right. And before you knew it, you'd have a hit. We would recover people's cars that were stolen years ago. We would call them up. Did you own a 1995 or a 2000 Dodge Caravan that was stolen? Yeah, we have it. We got a car back to this little old lady and the car had like rims and like a sound system that would move the wax in your ears. And she's like, what the hell? It's like, that's it's not my car, like, that's your car. <laughs> that's what it is now. Hey, Vic Ferrari is back. He is a, a retired detective with the NYPD auto theft unit. And he's back and we're gonna be talking about Grand Theft Auto. Check out the video. Yeah, the Grand Theft, the reason I thought about it, this whole thing is because of Grand Theft Auto came out. They came out with their trailer. I guess the, the, the actual game's not gonna be out in for about two years, but you know, your, we had had that discussion and, you know, the, the name of your book is, is Grand Theft Auto. Well, I guess, is it one of them or it's one of them? Yeah. I've written a series of behind the scenes NYPD books. And one of them is Grand Theft Auto, the NYPD's auto crime division. And that's loaded with funny stories and things that went on the whole NYPD's auto crime division, chop shops, exporting cars out of the country, things like that. Right. So I was, so, well, I, I, you know, after watching, I, I watched a few trailers and on Grand Theft Auto. And, you know, I listen, like, I've never played the game. But all these guys I have talked to, because I was locked up, you know, when those games started coming out and and they were popular. And I, I just, you know, and everybody loves those games. And honestly, talking to you about your experience and the stories that you were telling are just are right down that the game alley. And I was thinking we could go with kind of a whole, like, how close... You know, how close is that game? I mean, obviously it's polished and, you know, but the insanity of that game and working in the, um, in the auto unit, do you call it, what did you guys call it? Uh, the auto crime division. Auto crime division. How close is that game? I mean, the, you know. Well, I, I mean, the game, like we were talking about off air earlier, we grew up in a generation of Pong and Space Invaders and Asteroids. Right. So now video games, like there's a whole narrative with it and there's bad guys meeting and there's dialogue and then they go out and they're stealing cars and people are getting slapped around and there's pimps and hoes and, you know, it, it's, it's like a whole thing. Um, listen, I mean, I've never played the game either. I've seen like you have trailers and video, you know, my nephews years ago had it and I just, I couldn't get into it because it was just so, it's just too much. Um, but yeah, I'm sure they, they, they take stories from, from car theft rings or things that have happened in, with criminal activity and kind of integrated into their games. But, I mean, it definitely sounded like the, the stories we talked about last time, like the guy, like they were the whole, like the whole Chinese, um, thing, like th these guys were extremely organized. You know, you, you steal the car, you bring it here, you take it, they chop it up. They send the parts here. They send the parts there. I mean, it. You know, it sounded like it was a, a, a fairly good, you know, you got to make it fun, but a fairly good simulation. Um, oh, yeah. And and New York would, I mean, back when I was active in the 80s and 90s and 2000s, I mean, we were averaging 150,000 stolen vehicles a year. So it was like shooting fish in a barrel and it was just so easy. And then when they started with putting those little MDTs, the little mobile digital computers in the police cars, you didn't have to keep bothering the dispatcher and run plates every 10 seconds. And she would get pissed off. You could just sit there. And it was like it was like going to Las Vegas or a casino and throwing dimes in a slot machine. You're just punching plates, punching plates. This doesn't look right. That doesn't look right. And before you knew it, you'd have a hit. And then you'd be off to the races. And, and back then, it was just so easy. And like... <laughs> Early on, like one of the first, the way I got in, involved with stolen cars is, I don't know if you remember this, but probably it, it all changed in the 90s, but rent-a-cars, the first digit of a, a rent-a-car license plate was a Z. So you always knew if something was a rent-a-car and people would rent cars in New York City and never return them. And then the rent-a-car company would send out a couple of notices and the guy wouldn't return the car. So they would go to the precinct to report it stolen. And- we would just run, go around running Z plates and come up with hits all the time. But that changed. I think it was the early 90s. You had this uh, German German tourist came into Miami and yeah. they rented a car from the Miami airport and they got lost. I don't know if they got lost returning or trying to get out of the airport. 
And some thugs saw the Z plate. They figured out they were Taurus. They figured out they had cash and they carjacked them and killed them. So then yeah, they the guys changed would, it. Guys would look for, there. you know, there were carjackers would look for those plates. That was the problem. They knew this guy's from out of town. He doesn't know anything. He's a tourist. He'll roll his window down if I say, hey, wait, wait, wait. Because he doesn't realize how bad of an area he is in, you know. Um, so that's when they changed it. So, yeah, we can't. These We're making these people targets. Yeah, absolutely. And then there was a big lawsuit with it. And then they, you know, changed the license plates and they got plates like everything else. But like I said, it was just so easy. And I give you an example. So when I work at the precinct level, there was a, a section of the Bronx. It's um, 233rd Street and Jerome Avenue, for those of you in the New York City area. And it's right off a highway. So people would park their cars. They'd get off the highway and park their cars along this. It's about a mile long stretch. And you've got on one side of this mile long stretch, a park, Adam Chandler Park, which is woods, right? Then you've got four lanes, two and go in each direction. And then the other side, you had Woodlawn Cemetery. So there's no people around whatsoever. It's just people would park their cars on either side of this one mile stretch. And then they would jump on the four train and go into Manhattan. What we used to do is we would just set up, park our car with binoculars, and we'd watch people get off the train. And people that are walking, you know, they have a purpose. They got their head down and they're just walking straight. We quickly figured out guys that are going to break into a car or steal a car. They're always turning around. They're dusting themselves off. They they bend down to tie their shoe and look behind them. They, they, their head's on a swivel. And then we would watch them break into cars. And what, we I must have locked up and been involved in probably close to 70 or 80 auto break-ins or people stealing cars from that location. But one time, like I said, thieves progress. And one time we watched this kid. And he, he sits on, he's sitting on the railing and he's sitting opposite these cars. And I just see him go like this. I'm watching him with binoculars. He's just kind of like, what is he doing? Waving at something? Gets off the railing. And the next thing I know, he's in the car. I'm like, I, how did he break into the car? He's in it. We roll up. The kid's in the car. I forget if he was taking the radio or breaking the ignition. There's broken glass in the interior. He's got no tools on him. There's no rock inside the car. Like he's man, We didn't hear anything, right? So he was a heroin addict. We bring him back to the precinct. I read him his Miranda warnings, and uh, he's starting to go through withdrawal. He says, I'll tell you what. He says, you buy me a soda, and I'll tell you how I broke into that car. And I said, fair enough. So I get him a soda. And while I was searching him, I found in his pockets broken spark plug. I thought nothing of it. And he explained to me, he goes, I use Ninja Rocks. Go, what, the, what the fuck is a Ninja Rock? And he says, you take a, you, t you take a, a spark plug and you break it with a hammer and those little ceramic chips, if you toss it at a car window at a low rate of speed, it'll break the glass and basically not make a lot of noise. And it was like the lowest tech way I had ever seen to break into a car. Cause I lock guys up with slim gyms and coat hangers and car antennas bent a certain way to get them fish inside and, and pop the door lock. This guy, and then we quickly figured out it was a low-tech way for guys to break into cars with spark plugs. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I I knew a guy that would, he would take a piece of uh, tile, ceramic tile, and he'd take a slingshot, and he'd have someone drive by slowly a car, and then he'd shoot it out the window, and then drive off. You know, he'd knock the window out, but drive off and wait. They'd right. Wait if anybody noticed, anybody come, and then they'd come back and drop him off, and he'd jump in the car. Yeah, I, there's something to do with ceramic and 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 and, and that gl that glass that it just breaks it. But I don't even think he needed a slingshot. And it, no, this guy was doing it obviously at a high rate of speed. I mean, he's, oh, he's yeah. higher, and, it, and these are big pieces. You know, it's basically a rock. You know, he was like, it might as well have been a rock. Hey, it's a low tech way. It's little overhead to break into a car. But but that area was just, I mean, we would sit up there and I mean, I, I figured it out in the early 90s and I was still going up to that spot up until I retired in 2007. Another time we were sitting up there and uh, my partner and I, and we watched these two guys drive by in a car and I didn't get the plate. And the car drives up this road about a mile and they come back and forth and I'm like, all right, they're doing something. One guy lets the other guy out of the car. And he drives off. Now we're watching the guy that he dropped off and he's breaking into a car. I'm like, great. You know what? Let's follow them. 
a lot of times we'll just jump on them, but sometimes we'll follow them to see wh where they're taking the car. Are they taking it to a chop shop? Where are they taking it? Well, we're watching this guy break into the car. The other guy drives by. I run the plate on that car, and it didn't come back right away. So I part of goes, you know what? Screw this. Let's just lock the guy up that's breaking into the car. I said, all right. We drive down. The guy's in the car breaking the ignition. We cuff him up. We take him out of the car. Where's your friend? He's not saying a word. Pretending he doesn't speak a word of English, right? We throw him in the back seat. I get into the police car, right? We're going to call for a tow truck. And I look at the computer screen. The car that's been circling around with his friend is reported stolen. Mm -hmm. So like, oh, wow, this is great. And his friend drives by. So now we try to pull the friend over in the stolen car with the buddy in the back seat, right? We get him blocked in traffic. I jump out. I jump into the passenger seat with the car. My partner is trying to pull him out of the driver's seat. The car in front of us moves. The guy takes off with me in the front seat of the car with him, and I'm fighting him in the car. Finally, he got into an accident. My partner ran up. We dragged him out of the car, and we got two for one. We got the stolen car that they were driving around in, and we got the guy breaking into the car. <laughs> How, how, I have a question, like it, it, how often do you guys, where you were arresting people? I mean, personally, is it like once a week or is it like almost every day? Well, when I was in auto larceny and then the auto crime division, I mean, it, it was so easy back then. Uh, you could have a couple of arrests a week. If okay. you really, if you really put yourself out there and you were eating your lunch in the car, you weren't going someplace to eat and sit down and kill an hour and a half. And as soon as you got your radios, if, if you put in the eight and a half hours to look for a, a stolen car, you could get a couple of arrests a week. Okay. What do they get? How much time do they get? It depends. Um, New York City, and it depends on the borough. So like Manhattan and Queens back in the day, if you had a criminal record, and you could do a year and a half to three, and then it goes up, you know, it, depending on your record. But places like the Bronx and Brooklyn, where they tend to save, they tend to save taking things to trial for violent crimes like rape and murder. They'll plea out. It, it, it was nothing to arrest a guy and just look at his rap sheet and see that he's been locked up 15, 16 times for breaking into cars and stealing cars. And he's done 90 days on Rikers Island, which I wouldn't want to do 90 days on Rikers Island, but that's better than going upstate. Right. So he's ready to take a plea. Oh, yeah. What do they get for cars? It depends. It depends. Yeah. It, it, it depends. Like, you know, a lot of cars in New York were stolen back then. It was the pests. It was the teenagers stealing the cars to look cool and take their girlfriends around. Or it was junkies and drug addicts that would steal cars to get around and commit other crimes and get high. Um, the guys that really knew what they were doing and were, you know, in with the chop shops and the salvage yards, they probably they get a couple of hundred a car. I've seen guys get up to five hundred to a thousand dollars a car. It depends on the car, right? It depended on the car and it depended on the thief and how reliable he was. And if they needed something, they could call this guy up and he'd have a car with, you know, within hours or the following day. Because you got to realize something. So the, the auto insurance industry kind of fuels this. So say for argument's sake, you get into an accident. Say you got a new Honda Accord and you get into an accident and you got front end damage and you bring it to do two body shops and body shop A tells you, all right, you know, you got a thousand dollar deductible and it's going to take me about two and a half to three weeks to get your car back. You go to body shop B and he tells you, don't worry about the deductible and I'll have the car back for you in three days. Well, you're going to go to Body Shop B. Right. Body Shop B is going to get on the phone and call his buddy up and say, I need, you know, a 2020 Honda Accord to save me time that I don't have to paint it gray in color. Yeah, okay. And that guy is going to, and but that's why that thief would get paid more money because he knows the next day or a couple hours later, that guy is going to drive in that car. Mm, okay. I'm not sure how you fix that though. Yep. Well, LoJack changed a lot of things, and then GPS, because in the old days, the thieves would bring the car right to the location, right? It would go right into a junkyard. It would go right into a body shop. They'd take the parts off it, and then they'd drive it three blocks away, or they'd call a Bones truck, which is a guy that comes around and picks up the scrap metal, and they know damn well what's going on, and then they take the cut-up car, and they bring it to a scrap metal processor. When LoJack first came out, right, we were getting hits everywhere. All of a sudden, and these guys didn't know about it, so we were getting search warrants like every 15 minutes, running into this place, running places we didn't even know about, like 
storage facilities and commercial space buildings that just look like a regular nondescript garage. And we go in there, and there'd be 15 chop cars in there. And they were just as surprised as we were. But once Lojack came out, the strategy changed. So then what we used to get is we'd start getting these Lojack pings and we'd find a car parked on the street somewhere. So they would park a car on the street to let it cool off to see if the car had Lojack, you know, had Lojack or not. Well, I mean, don't they, can't they search for the Lojack? I mean, they were pretty big. At the, originally, they were big devices. They did. Well, look, I'll, I'll get at that in a second. Yeah, they, they, they did. The, the, the bad guys came up with a way how to defeat Lojack, the first version of it. And speaking of Lojack, so we were, we were very tight. The Lojack, Lojack guys had representatives that would work with the police. And they were usually retired cops and detectives that after they retired would get a job with Lojack. So I knew one of these guys. And he reaches out to us and he says, listen, I've got a bunch of guys from the Moscow Police Department because at the time, Lojack was branching out in, in, in Russia. So he says, um, would you mind, you know, showing them how it works and doing a question? I'm like, yeah, sure. Bring them down. Right. So I'm expecting like Arnold Schwarzenegger and Red Heat to come down. Right. Matt, when I tell you it's about 10 or 11 guys. And they look like thugs. Like I, I, they, they were like middle-aged guys. They look like bouncers at a Manhattan club. Like just big, big guys, with like rough-looking guys with rough knuckles. Like you wouldn't fuck with these guys. Like they, they, they were badasses. And their handler, the only guy that spoke English, was probably a KGB agent. And you know, we're going through the question and answer thing, and like they were kids in a candy store because they had seen all these NYPD movies, so they wanted to get into the police cars and play with the sirens and shit, right? And uh, we get to the question and answer segment, and uh, one guy says something to the interpreter, and the interpreter goes, "How you say? How you get confession out of bad guy?" It was like, "Oh no, 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 <laughs> no, no, no." We have things in the United States as Miranda warnings. We just don't go around tuning people up, right? And they're all just looking at each other, right? Because they watch NYPD Blue over there. And then the next question was, uh, what kind of uh, gun do you use to stop car? Like, oh, no, no, we don't shoot it. <laughs> That's a big no-no, especially in New York. We don't shoot into cars. And they're just like looking at us like we're a bunch of pussies, right? Yeah. So one of the guys goes out to their car and he comes out with this with a box. And they start handing us these little gift boxes. And there were these commemorative coins. I still have one around here somewhere. It's um, it looked like a bronze medal you'd win at the Olympics, and it had, you know, it was it was, it was written in Russian. So for all I know, it said "kiss kiss my ruski ass, capitalist pig." But it's something right. for the Moscow Police Department commemorating their 60th anniversary. It, it was really nice of them to give us, right? We had nothing for them. Absolutely, no one told us they were going to give us <laughs> gifts, right? So now we look like a bunch of douchebags. So I said, "All right." I run up to the locker room and I just start grabbing nightsticks and hats and just shit that's going to get thrown out and laying around the locker room like old stuff. And I, I put it in a garbage bag and I run downstairs and I'm like, listen, that you know, it was on short notice. I hope these the bag got torn open like these guys were fighting over shit. Right. And my partner's laughing. He goes, yeah, these guys probably fight over toilet paper. I go, you better keep your mouth shut or someone's going to get their ass kicked and it's going to be us. I had to go upstairs and get a second bag of stuff for them. But it, it was actually pretty cool meeting guys from the Moscow Police Department. But you were talking about how the bad guys defeated Lojack. That informant that I was telling you about in the last interview we did that got us Mike Tyson's motorcycle. Right. He, um, he told us that this thief had a Lojack detector. And we said, there's no such thing. And then we called up the Lojack representative. He's like, doesn't exist. I said, that's what we thought. And the guy goes, it does exist. We go, we'll go buy one from him. And it was a, it was, it was a converted police scanner. They did so, the, the old police scanners. You could change crystals. I think they're called. There's crystals in them. So it was like a Radio Shack police scanner that they had modified the crystals. And the Lojack representative brought a vehicle and we turned on a Lojack. We, you know, we, put it into the system. He walked around the car. It's like, boop, boop, boop. That, that, that device was FedEx. I think their, their headquarters at the time was in Massachusetts. That, that device was FedEx up there. And then they had, they, as a result of that, they had to change, I think the box. So the signal wouldn't leak out. Hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I was going to say now what they have those Apple chips and 
air tags and yeah yeah it's oh man it's insane air tags that's what i meant was air tags the uh, apple chips anyway the little they look like little right they look like little i like apple chips better yeah as mine's, yeah it's way better than air tag anyway um yeah you could drop that in your in your uh your wife's purse and tracker so you know these guys are tracking people left and right you know um but yeah, I can't. I couldn't imagine stealing cars. So what? What else? Uh, uh, we were what talking else? about that informant. I got a couple of stories oh, about I, that informant that I had remembered I from the last informant. time. I love the informant, by the way. I, he's that guy he's probably. He's. I bet you he's got ten hours worth of hilarious stories. If I think he's dead, but if he were alive uh, and his English, he he spoke in broken English. But um, that guy, yeah, that guy would be a show. And was then he from some, Haiti. What's that? But do you say he went back to like Haiti, right? And Dominican then he, Republic. Oh, Dominican Republic. Okay. He um. So here's here's a great story from him. He um. He calls us up and he tells us these guys that he's running around with. They went to an auto auction and they purchased a Dodge. Uh, they purchased a salvage, you know, a wrecked. Uh, and they were new at the time, Dodge Intrepid. And he says they're looking to steal a car. They, they took all the VIN numbers off the salvage. They threw it away. They got the title. They've got so we had the VIN number. We had all the information on this on this VIN kit. And he says what they're going to do is the next this weekend or the next weekend they're going to go out and steal another Dodge Intrepid and change all the VIN numbers on it. Great. And then we'll pick off that car, right? So he calls us up and he says. Um, yeah, he goes, uh, they, they stole the car this weekend. And we said, where? And he, he tells us the neighborhood it's in. So we said, all right. So I go to that precinct. There's no stolen vehicle report for a Dodge Intrepid. So we call him back and go, are you sure? He goes, yeah. And let's just say for argument's sake, he goes, I'm almost positive it was on like East 79th Street. I said, all right. So I kept going back to the precinct and there's no vehicle report for it. So finally, he calls us up. He goes, that car's never going to get reported stolen. What, what are you talking about? He says, his friends went out. They steal the Dodge Intrepid. They bring it to a garage. And they're just kind of going through the car. And they find a couple of kilos under the front seat. Mm, okay. And they can't believe their luck. So then they drove the Dodge Intrepid up to Westchester County in Yonkers. And they burned it. They says, he goes, so he goes, check with Yonkers police, or I, I think it was Yonkers. He goes, check and see if there's a Dodge Intrepid that's been burned. He says, because the owner's not going to report that stolen because he probably thinks it's been towed. And right. you guys are waiting to lock him up. And uh, he said, those guys spent the weekend. They sold the kilos for whatever they got for them. He goes, and they were partying, though. They were buying drinks for the block. And, you know, they were like heroes in that neighborhood. But, yeah, we would hear stories like that from him, you know. Another time, he told us about this um, Dodge and uh, uh, Dodge Caravan, where the VIN number was changed. The car was stolen, and they had masked it with a phony VIN. So he tells us where the car is, and I do the research on the car, and it comes back as a wreck. And I see the car, and we pull the guy over, and the VIN number is cockeyed. Bring the guy into the precinct, we lock him up, and it was um, it was it, it was I think it was in the three O precinct, which is in like just the outskirts of Washington Heights. And we're in the precinct doing paperwork, and I, I'm going out into the precinct parking lot. I'm going back and forth to this vehicle. I'm pulling the VIN out of the window and stuff. And I noticed that the guys on the block where we locked him up were across the street. They look like crows on a clothesline. And I'm like, why are they here now watching us? Like, usually after we lock somebody up, they're gone. Yeah. Why, like, why is the interest in this vehicle? So my partner calls up the inform, and he goes, listen. Vic and I are here at the precinct, and the whole block is across the street trying to figure out what we're doing with this car. He goes, let me go up to the block. He calls up my partner and our lady. He goes, there's a trap, a secret compartment in the Dodge Caravan. He goes, and there's weight and a gun in there. He goes, I don't know where it is. He goes, he goes and I don't want to ask because, you know. Yeah. He goes, but, so we started tearing that car apart, and where the trap was is in the back seat of that Dodge Caravan, there was like a, an armrest. And I forget, I think it was, I think it was hydraulic. I don't remember. We, we didn't go to try to figure out how to open it the correct way. We just started pulling stuff apart. And we, cause the vehicle was stolen. We found um, a couple ounces of Coke and a handgun, but we just couldn't figure out like why the interest in this car. And they were waiting to either steal it back or get into the car and get the weight and the gun out. I wonder, you, did you guys, do you, if you grab a gun like that, do you guys 
do ballistics on it? Yeah, what happened? Yeah, so when you recover a, a firearm, I know how New York City does it. You send it to um, the lab or the ballistics section, and then what they do is they fire it into a drum of water, and then yeah. you know they look at it, and then if it's a um, semi-automatic, they'll take the shell casing and see if there's a, they can also with, with a, a striking on, on the shell casing. So there's a couple of ways they can see if that gun was used in a crime. You know, when you're speaking about the um, the trap, did you ever hear about that guy that got, I think he got like 10 years or something? He was making traps or making trap doors or whatever, secret compartments yeah, yeah. for vehicles. And he, he advertised it and everything. And, and, of course, drug dealers were coming to him and bringing them. Oh, yeah. And his whole goal, his whole thing was like, I didn't know they were drug dealers. It could have been for anybody. It could have been somebody who wants to keep their gun there, wants to keep you know their money, their wallet. Like, I, how am I supposed to know? And they were like, no, like you should have known. He went to court and he went to like trial. I think he got like 10 years or something. Really? Like the guys in the Bronx, at least around over by Jerome Avenue, those guys were like Swiss watchmakers. Like you'd never know it was yeah. in the car. You, you kind of had to like look under the hood and see if there were like unique wires in there. But and then that, you know, and sometimes it was on pistons with hydraulics where the dash would open or they would build up, um, They'd build up a box that, like, it, you'd, you'd look at the front seat and, at, like, the, the leg area for the front seat and the passenger seat. If it was off, sometimes it was a box welded underneath. I mean, these guys were genius with some of the stuff they, they did. Yeah, I wrote, a, I wrote a story about a guy who he was buying, like, just a little bit of marijuana here. You know, what? Well, not even, it wasn't a little bit. It was, it, he says it was a little bit, but whatever. It was, like, 40 pounds, 50 pounds. From from a guy, and he'd been doing it for a few months. He said one day the guy was supposed to be delivering the some marijuana, and he was like, you know, he was a Mexican guy. You know, of course, he was actually cartel. He just had no idea, or maybe he just probably wanted to pretend that it, right. he didn't realize it. I mean, so the guy pulls up in an RV, and he goes, "Oh yeah, come on, come in, come in." He goes, "We climb up in the RV and walk around." Like he's like, "Oh, look around." He's like, "We open up the stuff." Oh, look, look. He's like, "No, you can't find." You can't find it, can you? They're like, no, what's up? Guy goes and plays with the radio, like pulls a switch and turns something on the dashboard. And they hear this. Eh. And he said, literally in the carpet, there's like a, a, a sheet of carpet. And he said, in the middle of the carpet, a little, you know, 18 inch or one foot by one foot section raises up like out of the carpet. He's like, you would have never known it was there. Right. It was perfect. It was seamless. Yep. And he said it only went up about eight inches. And the guy reached his hands down and pulled uh, a pound of marijuana out. He said, and with a string connected to another pound and another, he goes, and he literally, they pulled out hundreds and hundreds of things. Like it was just one block after another, after another. He said it barely fit through. And he said the whole bottom of the thing was just filled with marijuana pounds yeah, of it. Yeah, you wouldn't believe it. And you're right. That there's like a whole sequence. Like I've seen some where you put the car in reverse, you put the AC on, and then you hit the defogger. And that would activate something to open up. We we used to recover. So like the last show I did, we were talking about tag jobs where they would change the VIN numbers on cars. We would recover people's cars that were stolen years ago. Four or five years ago, they didn't have comprehensive insurance, so the insurance company didn't own it. We would call them up. Did you own a 1995 or a 2000 Dodge Caravan that was stolen six, seven? Yeah, we have it. And it was so funny because some of these cars were like tricked out cars. Like I remember one time we got a car back for this little old lady and the car had like rims <laughs> and like a sound system that would move the wax in your ears. And she's like, what the hell? It's like, that's not my car. Like, that's your car. <laughs> that's what it is now. And she's driving away with this thing with like speakers that you can hear it two miles away. But there's a story where I think it was up in the 4-7. They recovered this woman's car. It was reported stolen years ago. And um, she gets it back and, again, puts the car in reverse and does something. And a trap opens up and she finds a kilo of Coke and like a Tech 9. And she comes to the precinct with this stuff in a shopping bag. And she's like, you know, the desk goes like, what can I help you with, hon? And she's like, yeah, I found this in my car. <laughs> oh, um, what, uh, what, so what else is going on? <laughs> you want to the cockfight story? What? I'll tell you the cockfight story. Okay. So 
So it's probably I, uh, wait, wait a second. Did you notice that like there was like a little thumbs up thing that came up over here? Yeah. And a little heart. What is that? I'm not doing it. I, I thought it would, well, you know, you went like this and all of a sudden it made a heart. I noticed that before because I was telling a story and I saw a thumbs up pop up. That's yeah, not on I my end. Trust me, I'm not that tech savvy to do oh, something. Oh, me neither. I'm thinking this is like, what? What? what is this? Like, I'm wondering maybe, if it actually maybe recorded. Zoom has incorporated that. Yeah, it's, I've, I think I ha might have seen it before. Do this, do a, do a heart just for a second. Yeah, that, yeah see, see it. I, I see it. It's not me doing it. No, I know that, but it's not me doing it. Like I didn't like, I, I, nothing. We've been hacked. I, what's going on? Weird. Anyway, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. It's um probably about 2000. I know when this happened because it was around the time I got my first dog. It's probably around 2005. And um, I had come up with a couple of arrests that weren't auto theft related. I walked into a bodega and they, they it was a gambling den. Like they had leaf tables and they were counting all the policy slips. I locked a bunch of those guys up. Another time I locked up a guy with a gun. So my lieutenant calls me into his office. He goes, listen, he says, love what you're doing. He goes, stick to auto crime. Vice does vice. Just stick with it. I go, lieutenant, I just happened. He goes, I get it. Auto crime. So you got it, boss. So about a week later, my sergeant calls me into his office. He goes, we're getting killed with these Vespa motorcycle scooters. And at the time you had, it was like the hottest new item, these little Italian mopeds. And all these, you know, hipsters were buying them and, and then keeping them on the Upper East Side of Manhattan and they leave them outside and people were stealing them. So he goes, we're getting killed with these things. I said, I know. I says, but they're motor scooters. He goes, just make the problem go away. I said, all right. So I start pulling all these theft reports and I'm running the, the VIN numbers and the plates on these stolen Vespas. There's like seven or eight of them and like got stolen a month from the same neighborhood. And I see one of the Vespas gets recovered up in the South Bronx off the Grand Concourse in Hawkstone Avenue, right? So I go, okay, there was an arrest made with that. Probably a bunch of kids from that neighborhood are driving up there, stealing them. If I go up by Hawkstone in the Grand Concourse, I'm going to pick off three or four kids driving these Vespas, and I'll make the problem go away. So my partner go up there, driving around, no Vespas. Okay, well, it's all six-story tenement buildings there. It's not private houses or anything, so... All those six-story tenement buildings have basements and, and sub-basements underground. And usually you have a superintendent of the building. He lives down there, and he takes care of the building for free. And in these subterranean things, you have like these common areas where people store their motorcycles, their bicycles, snow shovels. It's storage. Right. So I start going building to building. We knock on the basement doors. The super comes out. And they're proud to show us their underground lairs, right? And they're opening these things up and no Vespas. So we went to about five or six, right? And I told my partner, come on, let's just do one more. We go into this last basement and I could smell weed. I could smell weed burning, right? So we go up to the door and pound on the door and I'm hearing giggling. And the door opens up and the super look like tattoo from Fantasy Island. He had perfect jet black hair, Right. And he's looking at me and his eyes are glassy and he looks like he's going to have a heart attack. And I go, Poppy, I said, um, <laughs> so he, he's, he's a short, he's short, like tattoo. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and he's got jet, jet black hair. And I go, Poppy, I go, would you mind if I could look in the common area? Would, would you have a problem with that? He goes, no. I said, oh, oh okay. Could, could you, he goes, okay. And he's shitting bricks and we're walking. And it's like the closer we're getting to this common area, the slower he's walking. And he walks up. It was a, it was like a rolling wall type thing, and it had um, a lock with an asp on it holding it together. And he dropped the keys. And I'm looking at my partner like, what the fuck is going on? That this guy is so nervous. He unlocks the lock, takes the asp off, and he pulls apart these doors. And he turns on the light. Matt, I kid you not. There must have been about fifty roosters and hens running around the fucking floor, right? And I'm just looking at him and he's looking at me. And then there's little cages or pods that are stacked about five feet high. That's got, I guess those were the fighting cocks. He's got, he's got, he's got like a hundred fucking roosters and hens in here. Now I know what they're doing. This is either a gladiator school or a breeding ground or a training ground for cockfighting. It's the Bronx. 
You right. know, this isn't Indiana. And he's looking at me and I'm looking at him and I go, any Vespas? And he goes, no. <laughs> I said, okay. And he goes, okay. I said, yeah, I don't give a shit. He goes, okay. And he locks it up, right? We go upstairs. I grab the cell phone. I call my sergeant. I go, listen to me. Get the fucking cavalry down here. I says, I just walked into like the world's largest cockfighting ring. My sergeant goes, yeah, but we, we don't do that. I go, listen to me. I said, our lieutenant is always looking. My lieutenant was a good guy, but he, he was always one of these guys on the outside looking in. Like he always wanted to be part of a press conference. He always wanted the next best thing. And I go, I go, he's going to love this. He goes, well, he went home for the day. He goes, call the ASPC. I go, an ASPC. I said, are you kidding me? I says, come on. I says, do you know how much overtime we're going to make with these birds and making phone calls? He goes, he left for the day. He says, I'm telling you, call the ASPCA. So, so what am I going to do at this point, right? I already let the guy go. So do you remember in the early 2000s, there was a television show. I think it was called On Animal Planet. It was called Animal Precinct on Animal Planet. It was the AS, believe it or not, New York City has the ASPCA police. And what they do is they're uniformed peace officers and they go out and investigate cases of animal cruelty. And there's a whole television show about it on, um, on TV. So anyway, I pick up the phone and I call, I call this number and I recognize the guy's voice from TV and I'm breaking his balls. And he goes, what do you want? And I said, listen, I said, and I explained to him what this is. And he goes, how many birds? I says, there was like 50 free range birds. I says, and then you had another 50, stacked in pods and he goes oh this is going to be huge for us thank you so much he goes i'll tell you what he goes we're going to look into this he goes if we get a search warrant i'll call you you can make some overtime you can come you come along with us i said all right deal i don't think nothing i like think nothing of it a couple of weeks go by and i take a couple of days off and i'm helping my dad put up this small fence in his backyard and we rent an auger yeah. You know, that little corkscrew thing that drills holes. Well, New York City isn't like Florida. It's very rocky and, and a lot of roots. And my father is drilling this thing. He, he doesn't think I know what I'm doing. So he takes the auger from me and he hits a root. And my father starts spinning around in circles. And I'm like, Dad, let go of the auger. So I had to, like, chuck him off. So while I'm laughing at him, my phone rings. And it's the guy from the ASPCA. And uh, he says, listen, we got a search warrant for the place. He goes, we're going to hit it first thing in the morning. You want to come along? I said, no, you know what? I said, I got to help my dad put in this fence. I said, I'm going I'm to be off for a couple of days. I said, you know, good luck with it. Thank you. Gets off the phone, right? Day or two later, I go back into work. It's on the front page of every paper. ASPCA police smash New York City's largest cockfighting ring, right? So I think it's funny. My sergeant comes up to me. He goes, was this what you were talking about? I go, yeah. How many cockfighting rings get exposed? I go, yeah. He goes, oh, wow. He goes, that's really cool. I said, yeah. Do you know he went, goes and tells the, so the lieutenant? Then the lieutenant calls me into his office. He goes, why did you call me? I go, you guys told me to stick to auto crime, not get right. involved in other things. And But yeah, I was involved in the New York City's largest breakup of a cockfighting ring that started with Vespas. And no, we never, we never figured out who was stealing the Vespas. Uh, I was going to say, why, if, if the guy knew you were a police officer and you'd just seen all that, like, and you guys didn't show up for weeks, like, you would think they would have immediately started moving the birds. Yeah, I would have. <laughs> but he probably figured, you know, it's auto crime. They don't give a shit. And I really didn't tip my hand. I just said, well, Vespas? And he's like, no. And I was like, all right. And I just turned around and walked away. Yeah, I would have. I yeah. mean, that, that would have been the first thing. I would have been on the phone, like, get these, get these birds out of here. But. Well, I've yeah. had, I know of, I've got, you know, multiple examples of like the secret service or the F well, more like the secret service showing up and they're like going to search the guy's house. And they're like, you know, the guy's like, look, I've, I've got, he's like, do you have anything in here that we should know about? He's like, I got a gun. He's like, yeah, we're, we're not the ATF. We don't care about a gun. He goes, well, I, he's like, I've got some, some weed. And he's like, yeah, we're not the DEA, bro. I mean, like, do you have, you know, whatever any whatever they were in, they were investigating actually in that one they were basically uh like stolen credit cards he was like you know he was like no that's all you know i've got that and i've got the equipment to make the cards he's like okay cool you know never said anything never charged him for the other stuff uh, i've had you know different examples where the dea comes in and they're like yeah we're not worried about this or we're not worried about that just minor things so it, it just depends like my lieutenant 
you know, he probably in hindsight because there was a press conference with it. That's why he had a shit fit. Right. But you know, short of that, yeah, they they just like you said, it's kind of compartmentalized. Stick to this. Well, you know, it's funny too. Sometimes they get a bigger crime and they could care. Like, you know, one of the things I did with these fake people that I never really talk about is the fact that all of these guys, like I always stick with the mortgages because that's when you're borrowing 200,000, you know, 150,000, 300,000. But, you know, I would have credit cards, you know, because these guys have perfect credit. So I'd run up their credit. They'd have 50 or $60,000 in credit cards. They would have. And so, you know, you're arresting me and that you've got a bunch of fake people but you've also got credit card fraud because I've got like six credit cards that total sixty or seventy thousand dollars. They don't even charge you for that. You know, that that dollar amount would never even enter into the um, equation. It was always just the bank fraud for the mortgages. Yeah, I guess they figure they got you. Why yeah. pile on and 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 that might have something to do with the judges. Maybe they get bent out of shape mm-hmm. where they think they're overcharging. Right, or maybe too, like if they if it wasn't keep in mind if it wasn't mortgages. And they'd grab me for the for the like a fake identity with the credit cards. They would have charged me for the credit cards. You know what That's, I'm saying? Yeah. Oh, yeah. If they could prove one thing, yeah, that, that they would have come at you with that. Right. Like I think the credit cards were so minor in comparison. You know, you borrowed a million dollars in mortgages, and you've got forty thousand dollars in credit card debt. Yeah. What do I? It's care? like pennies, I guess, the way they yeah. look at it. But so, uh, what else? <laughs> All right. So in in the um. Probably around the early 2000s, late 90s, they started with airbags, right? And airbags started showing up everywhere. And thieves quickly figured out they could get, I know in New York City, they were getting $500 for a set of airbags. So once those things came out, car dealerships were getting hit. It was nothing to see like just people driving around with holes in their dashboards. And They'd go to salvage yards and junkyards, and they'd sell them their airbags back for fifteen hundred dollars a set, and they were paying the thieves five hundred. And there was a guy in the Bronx, I can't think of the name of the place. He was basically one of the biggest buyers of stolen airbags, and he knew they were stolen. And what he was doing was he was shipping these things out all over the country, and he was paying the thieves in check, in check. So that's how we were able to catch all the thieves, but. So one of the guys in my office came up with a plan. He went to the feds and uh, with the FBI, they set up a, they started up a a bogus company in New Jersey, bogus post office box and everything. And then they started calling this guy and having him put airbags and shipping them to New Jersey. Once you do that, it's mail fraud, interstate transfer, stolen property. And we, he got locked. I mean, he, he made millions over the course of like two or three years. But like the amount of thieves we round up just because the check cash in place was right down the block. So it was just like, they just went to the, you know, and who was cashing these checks and for all these airbags. And a lot of the thieves went away federal for it. Um, you know, that reminds me of the, uh, you know, these people that can, you know, you can go into stores and basically as long as you steal, what is it? Less than a thousand dollars or something in, in LA and, or in California. There was a guy who was giving people orders, you know, homeless people and stuff to go into this store, steal these items, come, get, come back out and I'll buy them from you. And he was putting them on eBay. He, he said he had like a warehouse filled. He'd started a store on eBay. It was He was making tons of money. He did it for like two years straight till they busted him. I was going to say, they, 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 yeah, and then we're talking about it. So obviously they, they caught him. Yeah. Yeah, they'll do that. And, you know, it, it's almost incentivizing theft because if you, you know, you keep raising the limit to a felony. You know what I mean? It, it's it, it just incentivizes because nobody, everybody knows I'm not going to go to jail. And if I get caught, it's going to be a slap in the wrist. Well, I'll pick up garbage on the side of the road for three days, community service, and that'll be the end of it. Anything else? Well, with the airbags, we used to, one time we were in a McDonald's park a lot in the Bronx getting coffee. And um, this new newer Nissan, I think it was a Maxim or an Ultima drives by. And it's got a temporary plate that looked, photocopied and it's missing the two airbags so my partner and up get out of the drive through line and we pull up we pull them over in the parking lot and the guy hands me all this bogus paperwork and i go what is this he goes it's a 96 hour permit i go what's a 96 hour permit he goes well i'm test driving it i said for 96 hours he goes yeah i go it i go from it was north of south carolina 
I said, dude, give me a break, right? He goes, no. He goes, that's, that's how they do it down there. And I'm looking at the paperwork. I go, well, you're going to have to drive really fast. I says, because according to this paperwork, the car's got to be back by 6 o'clock tonight. So I said, wait here. Now, this is before cell phones. So I walk into the McDonald's. I ask the manager to use the phone. I call the dealership in South Carolina. And I said, this car isn't coming back reported stolen. I go, um. He's out on a 96-hour permit, and the owner goes, what the fuck is a 96-hour permit? So I knew. So they did a car, they did a lock count. He goes, yeah, that's my car. He goes, I don't know how it got up there. So we were able to lock them up on that. There was another kid um, one time. I mean, this is kind of scary, but one time um, I'm in my office, and I hear another detective talking to somebody on the phone, and he gets off the phone. He goes, I just got the weirdest phone call. And I says, what's up? He goes, it's, it's a jilted lover. He says, this guy is calling up and he says his boyfriend goes to clubs in Manhattan. And what he does is he goes into the coat rooms. He sneaks into the coat room when the check girl leaves or something. He gets in there and he goes through people's pockets and he grabs their car keys. Then he walks around the neighborhood of the club hitting the key fobs. And if, if he can open a car, he steals it that way. He says, OK, I never heard of stealing a car that way, but it's kind of kind of interesting. He goes, well, he's got a car parked up in the Bronx. I said, all right. I says, well, let's go up there. So it was three of us. We ride up there. We see the car parked. And it's early in the morning. And um, one of the guys we're with gets hungry. And he says, I, I got to get something to eat. I'm like, we're not leaving this car. He goes, well, come on. It's, it was like 10 o'clock now, 10 in the morning. He goes, I'll, just, I'll, just, I'll, I'll be back in 10 minutes. So he leaves me and the other cop standing on the corner watching this car, right? And um, I says, I got an idea. We get this guy to move the car. So we went into a bodega and we bought a dozen eggs. And then we threw our hoodies on. We ran by and we egged the shit out of the car. Then we went back up to the corner. And we're laughing like I hadn't thrown eggs in a car in 20 years. And we're standing up there laughing. And the next thing you know, you see the lights come on, blink on the car. And this guy was big. Find out he was a personal trainer. Guy comes down. He's wearing a canary fleece. And he's pissed and he's flicking the eggshells off the car like, all right, this is him. So I'm walking on the side, told my partner, I go, you go in the middle of the street on one side. I'll walk on the sidewalk on the passenger side. I go, when he go, when he gets into the car, we'll just jump him. So walking, we got no car because the other guy went to Wendy's and we're coming down the street and guy gets in the car. I run up on the passenger door and I, I open the door, you know, and police don't move and he looks at me. And then my partner pulls open the passenger door. He starts the car. And now he's starting to ram the two cars. You know, in New York, everybody, it's, it's, it's parallel parking. So now yeah. I'm in the car with him and he's ramming the two cars. My partner's grappling with him. I'm able to throw the car in park and get the key out. And I throw the keys on the sidewalk. Now he's got nowhere to go. So I run around to the driver's side and we're pulling on this guy. Just get out of the car. Get out of the car. Matt, this guy was like 6'4", built like a brick shit house, right? You know, me and my partner, like 5'9", five, 5'10". Five, he's got us by 40 pounds each, and he's just throwing us around like toys. You know, like I'm grabbing his legs, and my partner's going high. I'm going low. Finally, we get him on the floor, and we're rolling around. My partner's like, you know, call for help, call for help. And I'm like, I can't find my radio. And I look, and the my radio popped out of my back pocket now, and it's underneath the car. And now, like in the Bronx, a crowd is forming. And all you need is one or two rebel rows, and we're going to get stopped. But the crowd was more, it was first thing in the morning. It was more like older crowd, and they were more curious and watching the fight. Like they were betting on the outcome as opposed to getting involved. And um, I told my partner, I go, can you hold this guy like just an extra set? It's, it's so funny. We're talking like the guy isn't even here, and he's listening to everything we're saying. And I go, can you just hold this fucking guy like an extra second? My partner goes, hurry up. I reach out of the car. I get on the radio. I call for help. Now, I mean, New York City, I mean, you got 40, 50 cars coming and you can hear them. And I told the guy, I go, now would be a good time to give up. Right. He goes, all right, all right, all right, all right. You got me. So we get cuffs on the guy, right? Everybody shows up and we're covered in blood. And I'm like, where the fuck did all this blood come from? Right? Like, I don't know if I got nicked or my partner got nicked or he got nicked. So we put him in the, we put him in the radio car. I'm in the back seat with him. My partner's driving. And the guy, I mean, he's like, I got to talk to you guys. I said, all right. I says, well, when we get to the precinct, I'll read you your Miranda warnings. I says, we talk all day long. He goes, no, no, no. I got to tell you something. I got to tell you something. 
I'm like, what's up? And he goes, I'm HIV positive. I said, oh, shit. Now, we're covered in blood. Right. We're all over my pants, right? I said, all right. So we get to the hospital. We get another cop to watch him. My partner and I run into the bathroom. It was like a closet. We kick in the door. We're like scrubbing ourselves with this hospital soap, burning hot water, and we're looking. I don't have any cuts. Do you have any cuts? I don't have an open wound. Do you right? The bad guy was the one that had the open wound, unfortunately. And, um, you know, that was a rough two years. Like, I remember the doctor telling us, he goes, we could start you on this experimental cocktail of antivirals and everything. And I says, well, what's the downside of that? He goes, it's like dropping a nuke on your body. He says, it can, you know, he goes, it can have adverse reaction to your liver and kidneys. He goes, he goes, I don't see any open cuts or wounds. He goes, you said it didn't get into your eyes. He goes, I think you're all right. He says, but he goes, you know, you got to get tested every, I forget what it was, every six months or something. So like for two years, my partner and I were getting tested, but, you know, turned out all right. But I mean, sometimes you just think like an, a, a regular arrest is going to just go, you know, the guy's just going to put his hands behind his back and you're in the fight of your life and then you're covered in blood. Listen, I worked as a uh, car salesman for a, a for a dealership that used to be here called Reeves Import Motor Cars. I only worked there a few months, but a guy came in, young kid, 19, 20 years old. He came in, he, he hung out with uh, one of the salesmen, an older salesman, probably 45 years old or so in his forties. And the, so the kids walking around with him, test driving car after car after car and come to find out like, you know, through the grapevine, we found out that the kid had won the lottery and he had gone, he, and he told the, you know, told the, um, finance manager and the, uh, the, the, uh, car salesman that he had already gotten an accountant and the accountant said, look, you know, you might as well buy, you know, you basically, if you buy about a million dollars worth of cars, they'll depreciate, but you will be able to take that depreciation and you'll, it'll help with your taxes. And like, he had this whole thing that his accountant said, he said, so that's why he was driving cars. Cause he needed to buy a million dollars worth of cars. And they were so excited at the dealership. They gave him like a Porsche to drive until, you know, whatever it was like Monday. Cause at Monday he was going to get a cashier's check. And he spent the whole day with this guy on like Friday. Yes. Right. So come Monday, the kid didn't answer his pager. Cause this was back pagers, you know, um, didn't answer the pager several times throughout the day. Then Tuesday came, wasn't answering the pager. So he's now had this car for four or five days. So finally, and he had called and left several messages on his um, recorder. So finally, the salesman called and some guy answered the phone. He was like, hey, uh, uh, you know, is, is Todd there? And the guy's like, no, Todd's not here. He hadn't been here in a while. He went to Miami. And he goes, uh, and he said, went to Miami. He's like, okay, well, listen, I'm, this is, you know, this is Bob from Reeves Import Motor Cars. He said, uh, we lent him a vehicle and you know he was supposed to be back on monday i mean we're, we're we're seriously considering calling it in stolen he goes oh man did he get you with that lotto scam <laughs> he goes what oh, oh. he said oh what he tell you he was gonna get he won the lottery right and that what he tells you guys and he's like yeah yeah look he said if i hear from him i'll tell him <laughs> like the guy showed up did they like, catch him no he showed up a couple days later he just he like stopped you could leave the car and the keys in right, like, right, 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 right. Like the next day he had dropped the car off and left the keys. And he's, and then he, he was basically, he does this like every month or two, he'd go get a dealership and they would give him a car for, let him drive it around for three, for really only for a couple days, but he would keep it for two or three more days. But they think he's, he just right. won the lottery and he had the, the scheme, the whole buying a million dollars worth of cars and depreciating them and taking them as depreciation, like didn't make sense to me, but I'm not a CPA. I'm not a tax person. I don't know. You know, none of these guys were, but. Yeah. And salespeople, man, I mean, they hear that, you know, the commission on that. It's like they, they're not going to ask too many questions. And he spent the whole day with them. But you're this is a 19 year old kid. He doesn't care about spending a Saturday with you. Like no. he spent Saturday driving, driving sports cars like this. Is what a, this is great. And then I get um, then they're going to put me in a poor. I'll convince them to put me in a Porsche for a couple days. It'll turn into five. <laughs> I'm going to Miami. <laughs> yeah, and then they don't want the bad publicity with it, and as long as there's nothing really wrong with the car, they, they, they're not going to look to make an issue with it. Right. So I thought that was funny. That but. is funny. 
I wouldn't recommend doing it. No. Because if they put an alarm on that car, because if they go to the police and put an alarm on that car and he gets caught driving the car, then they're yeah. going to charge him with grand loss in the auto. Yeah, this was back in, um, when was I at that dealership? Eighty. I want to say 89. I, I think I sold it. It was right after I graduated high school. So it was probably 89 or 90 or something. It was just during that Imagine time. That's a rough way to make money. What? Car salesman. I mean, I think so. And I think that, you know, my understanding is that a lot of the car salesmen, you know, they have drug problems, they have alcohol problems, they, you know, it, it, it's a tough business. So you get a lot of these guys that, you know, and they work 60 hours a week because you're basically just sitting around making phone calls, sending emails, but you're basically hanging around most of the time. So, uh, it's the same as when you walk in to buy a piece of furniture. It's like they're just hanging around and it's like you see them coming at you from every angle. And the first one yeah. that gets to you, you know, hi, I'm Marge. Um, <laughs> what do you, if, if you need something, please use my name. Like, okay. Have you ever, speaking of furniture, have you ever been in, in an Ikea? Yeah. Keep in mind, I, when I went to prison, there was no Ikea. So I went in one, uh, the one down here in, uh, I want to say it's in, is it in St. Peter, Tampa? I don't know. It's down 75. Man, that place is massive. Massive. And, and there's no way to even really figure out, like, once we were like, okay, I've been here for 45 minutes, like a, an hour. I, I, I'm just ready to go. We couldn't find an exit. I thought, if this place burns down, everybody dies. Like, they've got it set up so that you can't get out. But It's funny you look at it that way. That, that's interesting. I listen, I look at everything as escape. We we went um <laughs> we went gator uh hunting the other day. So I mean we didn't I didn't kill a gator, but you know, we get on the airboat and it goes all through uh, Okeechobee. And what's so funny about that, that's something that like my my wife loves. Like she she used to hunt and everything. So, you know, we just went and she thought I should go. But um, and it's in the middle of the night, and all I could think of was if, if I fall off this boat. Right. If anything happens, you're never getting out of this swamp. You don't know which direction is which. And as they drive through at night, the guy's got a flashlight, right? And it's like, there's a pair of eyes. There's a pair of eyes. There's a pair of eyes. There's two eyes. There's two two sets of eyes. There's two sets. There's a pair of eyes. Their alligators are everywhere. Everywhere. And I thought, you, not only that, even if the alligators weren't there, you'll never find your way out. You're so deep in that place. But the alligators would kill you, and then nobody would find your body. No. Yeah, panthers there, feral hogs. No, no, this was in the, the swamp. These are airboats. They're in the swamp. So there's no land. It's about three feet deep, maybe five feet deep, and it's not and it's got these these um uh sawgrass? Yeah, that sawgrass, but it's sawgrass that's like eight, ten feet high. So if you fell in the water, even if you could stand up, you you can't. Where am I? Yeah, you'd never get out. Yeah, it's Lake Okeechobee. You've seen that. You know where Lake Okeechobee is in Florida. Yeah, yeah. It's massive. I don't know that I'd ever get out of there. I, that, that Gators would definitely eat me. Oh, fuck yeah. Yeah, so it was fun for about an hour. Unfortunately, we were out there about four hours. D did I tell you the story? I, I became a cop for a small police department in Florida after I retired and down here in Florida. And um, I spent... Half a day learning how to wrestle an alligator. No. Nah. I'm a city kid. You know what I mean? Born and we had crime. We didn't have fucking wildlife. And they, they're giving you duct tape and they're telling you like to sneak up on them. And I'm like, I'm not doing this. I'm like, can't we just shoot them? No, we don't want you shooting alligators. I'm like, but why not? You know, you know what I mean? They hunt them down here. Like what if a road gator gets in a woman's kitchen or something? I'm not fucking around with duct tape. He's going. You, you know what I mean? Like I'm not screwing around with Jurassic Park. Yeah, they're 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 least, and you know it's well, and you know this. Like it's funny because sometimes people will get nipped and they'll still die just a little bit because the bacteria and stuff yes. in their mouths is so toxic, it'll kill you. That'll kill you. You just get you you might get away, but it did nip you. It get caught you, and you're like, oh, and you know it's obviously going to hurt, but you think, oh, I survived. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. You might if you don't lose that arm. Oh, you may be oh. dead in, in a week. It's Can't horrible. Yeah, we horrible. didn't have that stuff up in New York no. City. You want, uh, you want to hear the diplomat story? I got. I, yes. All right. So I get a phone call 
from director of security for Mercedes Benz in Manhattan. And he says, I got, I got something here. I don't know what to do with it. And I says, well, what's up? He goes, this Mercedes comes in for service. He says, and, um, the VIN number's off. He says, so we contact Germany and they keep, you know, it's Mercedes, they keep records. And he says, this vehicle that's sitting here, you know, that's getting an oil change was manufactured in Germany for France. This car's supposed to be in France. He goes, and then they, I don't know how he did it, but the car was taken in a home invasion in France. He goes, and somehow it's sitting here in this car dealership. He goes, and they're about to leave. I says, all right. I says, get the VIN number, get the license plate. Don't, don't hold them up. I'll look into it, right? So run the VIN number. You know, it's, it's made for France. So now what am I going to do with this? Well, this was after 9-11. And after 9-11, the NYPD started sending detectives and supervisors with Interpol to different cities in Europe looking for extremists and, and terrorism before it reached the United States. So I found out that we had an NYPD sergeant in, in working in France. So everything is five hours ahead or five hours behind. I finally get a hold of this guy and I go, listen, I got a mystery. I says, I've got this Mercedes. Can you look into it? He goes, sure. In the meantime, the car is coming back a couple of days later. So my partner and I are like, we'll pick this car off. So it's, it's in lower Manhattan uh, over by the Hudson. We park on the side of the dealership where cars line up to go in first thing in the morning. And the license plate the guy gave me made no sense. I ran it through 50 states and it didn't come back to anything. Here comes the car and it's got diplomatic plates on it. Like, oh shit, well that changes things, right? You're not really supposed to mess with those people. They have diplomatic immunity. So I watch the car go in and um, my partner and I get out. We go into the dealership. It's a guy probably in his early 40s. He looked like the bass drummer for U2, Adam Clayton. He had like the wire rim glasses, skinny jeans, very European. And he was with this 25-year-old knockout beautiful girl. She looked like she was going to give birth at any minute. And she was wearing like a chinchilla pelt coat. And they drop the car off. And then they're walking through the showroom and perusing and they leave. Once they leave, I tell the uh, the director of security, I go, listen, I says, I'm already working on the VIN number and stuff in France. I go, um, you know, it's a diplomatic vehicle. I can't seize it. I got to go through proper channels with this. I says, again, let them go. I says, now I've got all their information. He gave me all their information. I says, I'll look into it. So a couple of days later, this NYPD sergeant in France calls me up. He goes, yeah, that's stolen. If you think it's complicated now, it gets even more complicated. So the vehicle is stolen a year or two earlier in France in a home invasion. Somehow this car stolen in France is shipped to the United States from Africa. So somehow from France, it went to Cote d'Ivoire, which is right next to Nigeria, it was shipped to the United States in an international ship in a uh, diplomatic shipping container. And the, the country with the diplomatic immunity is Vanatu, which is a, it, it's, it's an island in, in, the, in the Pacific. So you got multiple countries involved in this. The woman is a diplomat. Her husband's a Brit. And, but he shares diplomatic immunity because he's married to a diplomat from Vanatu. I said, all right. I said, so I can't arrest these people. I'm not even supposed to like detain them. I'm going to go and steal the car. I'm just going to have them stay. See what happens. PC. I'll find out where they park it and we can get into that. I've stolen a couple of cars in the line of duty with search warrants, put in listening devices. But so I'm going through that and um, my lieutenant goes, you know what? Call the FBI. I said, all right. So the FBI tells me, call the State Department. So I call the State Department. And they look into it and they go, yeah, this is some shady stuff here. He says, but again, you know, it's very touchy feely. Please don't steal this car. You're going to start an international incident. I said, all right. He goes, I'm going to reach out to this diplomat from Vanatu. I'm going to tell her that the car her husband brought into this country is stolen and we'd like it back. And I said, you think she's going to surrender? He goes, yeah. He goes, she, he goes, there's like three diplomats from that country. They don't want to screw up their gig over here. Right. Calls me up. He says, she's going to bring the car in. I said, perfect. So I show up. 
And it's not the woman I saw with him, the young woman that's pregnant. It's a middle-aged woman. Very nice. I don't understand. Um, my husband does international business. This is a big misunderstanding. But here, please take the keys. I'm like, okay, thank you very much, right? Get the car back. And that's about as far as I can go with this. Can't lock up diplomats, right? The FBI and the State Department knows about this. I back off. About a month later, I'm in my office and the phone rings. And one, one, guy, one of the guys goes, there's some English guy on the phone and he's cursing you. He goes, you got you to talk to this guy. He's pissed. So I get on the phone and it's a guy from England. And he's like, he goes, I was out of the country on business and you seized our vehicle and you had no right to do it. I know what it is. He's pounding his chest in front of his wife. Right. You know what I mean? Because she's like, what the fuck is this? And now he's going on and on and on, you know. And I said, you know, I says, are you done? I says, you know, that woman that I saw you with in the Mercedes dealership, the pregnant one, did she have the baby? And he and I didn't hear a thing. <laughs> it's because, you know what I found funny? That's not the woman that I met that surrendered the car. That's the, your wife is a little older, right? Thank you, detective. When he got off the phone, I never heard another thing about it. <laughs> he didn't know that I saw him with the young woman. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, he had bigger problems at that point. You I don't know off. if she was listening on the phone, but he couldn't get me off the phone fast enough. He was cursing and jumping up and down, screaming like Yosemite Sam, and then he didn't want to play no more. Yeah, I've never even heard of that country. I didn't either. It was on Survivor. <laughs> uh, uh, um, okay. Yeah, I, you know, as you tell your stories, I I'm think to myself, I wonder if I could make a, a short with that. You know, a short out of that. That's that's you know, because your stories are great because they're they're perfect for shorts. Because even though they take five or ten minutes, it's it's easy to 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 trim a five minute story down for a a one minute short. You know, it doesn't take thirty minutes. It takes ten, five, and then then it's easy to just. Yeah, and that's and that's what my books are. They're just. You know, they're not, my books, there's no beginning, middle, end. It's not like a novel. There's there's a chapter about something, and then there's three or four stories about things that happened to me, you know, dur- during my NYPD career. You want, you want to hear about me stealing cars in the line of yeah. duty? So Hey, so you know what? You know what, reminded, what that reminds me of is that I was really fascinated. Although I know this happens, but I was fascinated. Did you watch Getting Gotti? Yes. Where they like broke in and put the had put the yeah. listening devices in and you know they're they're watching and some guys coming down the street and everybody pulls out and then they go back and I thought that was I thought it was pretty interesting. I, I listen. I never broke into a mob social club, but I, one of the stories is so we we had a case with these guys. Um, they were Bronx guys and um, West Indian, uh, Jamaica, uh, Guyana, and they they were going up to Westchester County, which was like the county right next to us, very affluent. And they were stealing high-end cars, bringing them back to the Bronx. And they were into racing. So they would t- they'd blow motors. They were racing BMWs and stuff. So th- they would blow motors and get into accidents. They would go up to Westchester County and steal these cars. So we did a joint case with um, Janine Pirro's office. And uh, at one point during the case, what these guys did was they stole a 5 Series BMW. They, t- they changed the license plate. And then they put a business card over the VIN number. And they were using this five series because it was a nice car and they're going into an affluent area and they're driving around Westchester County using that car, you know, to drop guys off to steal cars. And it was perfect because the car fit in the neighborhood. It could outrun probably most police cars that handled well. They were always wearing gloves. So if they they had to abandon ship, the car's not going to come back to anybody. They're wearing gloves. There's no fingerprint. This is before DNA and stuff. So we figured out. The car was stolen. We got the VIN number for it. We went to BMW, got a key cut for it. So the plan was we were going to break into the car, take it, bring it someplace, and have a GPS installed and a listening device that we could hear the conversations in the car. So these guys- How long does that take? I'm sorry? How long does that take to do all that? To To get the key? No, to, I mean, to, you're taking it and you, you have to know that you can be gone for what, eight hours, two hours? No, no, no. We got we had this thing. So what we did was um, the NYPD has a highway unit. It's in the Bronx. It's where the highway cops, they're kind of like the state police for the NYPD. But that's where the garages are. So on a midnight, we had our guys from Taru, which are our tech guys on standby 
in this garage at like two o'clock in the morning. So we did it like this. I had a key made. We had a field team, right? We knew these guys were, they usually were done stealing by 12, one o'clock in the morning. We waited till two to make sure they were asleep. And they parked the car across, like right in front of this Jamaican's house, one of the thieves. So we did it like this. I get dropped off down the block. I was supposed to get into the car, move it out of the space. And then once I left, we were going to put another car in the parking spot because we didn't want to lose the space because the guy comes out, the car's across the street. He's going to know something's up. So I get dropped off. I got a hoodie on. And these guys are violent. Like actually one of these guys went, got like five or 10 years for that case, was deported to Jamaica snuck back into the United States and almost killed a cop stealing a car in a car dealership in Westchester. But anyway, um, I get dropped off. I get into the five series, put the key in the ignition. It's not starting. And I'm like, shit, did they disconnect the battery? Did they put a kill? Did they take the, I mean, these guys are pretty tech savvy. Did they put a, uh, um, a kill switch in it? Call will not start, right? I get out of the car. I go up the block. I tap my radio. Somebody picks me up. So we meet, we meet in a parking lot somewhere and uh, we're going like, what do you think? What do you think? And I'll never forget one of the detectives in my office looks at me, goes, is it a stick? And I said, I didn't even think to fucking look. It was so dark. They drop me off again. I get in the car and I feel around. It's a stick. I stick my foot down on the clutch. Broom! <laughs> the car starts right. right up. I pull out. I get on I-95. Get off Pelham Parkway, go down to um, the highway unit. Tech guy, as soon as I that car goes in, the hood goes up, the dash comes. They had that thing. We had that car back in an hour. Mm. Okay. Probably a little Fast. over an hour. Yeah. And then we were able to track them, monitor them from the laptop because you're following guys. There's always, there's always that risk when you're following guys, especially in the middle of the night. You know what I mean? It's one thing to follow people in the daytime. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of cars. At night, the herd gets thin. There's less cars right. on the road, and then you notice things more. Like, that's the third time I've seen that red Jeep. You know what I mean? That, 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 that second time I saw that Crown Vic. So with a laptop, we knew the neighborhoods they were getting dropped off. We were listening to what they were saying, and they all went to jail. Okay. But I was scared shitless the second time going back to that car. I'm like, what if this guy comes out and, you know, starts shooting at me? Yeah. Okay. So, by, by the way, I, I don't know if you use StreamYard. I have. Okay. You don't understand that there's a resume button, like a pause button, but right next to it is the reset button. Oh, you could lose everything. You could lose everything. And I've literally hovered over it for a second, and I was waiting to hit the button for the person to kind of finish their sentence, and I like, happened to glance up, and I was like, oh, my God. You should put like a piece of tape over your screen. I <laughs> so, yeah, I know. You get fucked. Yeah. Oh, I've done that. I've, I've talked to somebody one time for 20 minutes and we had a great conversation. It was a, she's a cold case detective. And then all of a sudden I, I was thinking to myself, man, this is a great conversation, you know, which I didn't expect it to be. And I glanced up at the, cause I thought how long we've we been talking. And, you know, I looked up at the timer and it's funny, it, it wasn't there. And I thought that's weird. Oh, and man. I went, no, I never hit record. Like I've done some stupid things. I don't typically do stupid things twice. It happens, bro. I, I've been on a couple of podcasts where not big ones either, where they for whatever reason they lost the file or it didn't it didn't like you said it didn't record and then they call you back and it's like, I'll do it. But it's like it's almost like we live in a date again. Right. And it's the same questions and the same thing. And it's like you don't have that enthusiasm. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's like now I gotta change things up or I'm gonna get it's gonna come off that I'm bored. Right. It's not, it's not going to go for a good interview. How is your channel doing? Not bad. I'm getting probably about 600 uh, downloads or uploads per episode. Okay. Is that, are you talking about on YouTube or? No, no. YouTube is a small crawl just on um, uh, Apple, iTunes and, and Buzzsprout and all that. No, no. Uh, um, you, you, the episode I did with you did well. But I'm probably on that. I'm probably on YouTube, probably just average. I'm just crawling out of that, like 40, 50 an episode. Right. I haven't really figured out YouTube yet. No, it's it. You really you have to 
go on other people's programs and you have to talk about your podcast. You have to mention the podcast to drive traffic that way, or you have to do shorts. I'm telling you shorts, you'd be shocked how much they will drive traffic. The problem is the shorts drive subscribers. So people will go to your channel and subscribe, but they don't really watch the videos. It's a different crew. Yeah, exactly. All right. I'll mention the pot. I'll mention my podcast at the end. Yeah. Um, so what, what, uh, what else? All right. So you want to hear me stealing cars. All right. So I got two more cars cars that I stole in the line of duty. Another one was driving around the Bronx and I see this, um, Chevy blazer parked and I run the plates parked. I run the plate and the year is off. There's just things on that blazer that shouldn't be on that blazer. So I do a whole history on it. I find out that it's salvaged the whole nine yards, but the car is registered to a fictitious person. So I'm like, okay, if I pull somebody over, they're going to tell me I borrowed it from a friend. I, right. Or, right. So yeah. I need somebody to report that thing stolen. So what I do is my partner, and I get a warrant for the car and um, did it in broad daylight, like 10 o'clock. And it was a Friday, like this time of year, it was just before Christmas, 10, 11 o'clock in a nice neighborhood. We pull up with a flatbed truck. I hook the side, I pull it out hook it up and the alarm and had an alarm I'm like shit. And it's, you know, the alarm's going off and we're driving away with this thing with the alarm going, no one stopped us. Hey, what are you doing? I mean, we weren't dressed as cops. Just was an unmarked flatbed truck and, and, and two middle-aged guys yoking this car. No one said a thing, right? <laughs> Bring it back to the precinct, take it out to the pound. Monday or Tuesday, I, I go into the system. Somebody files a report for it stolen. So, couple of days later, I call the guy up. The, the name on the report is different than the registered owner. And I says, um, yeah, I've been trying to get in touch with the owner. I says, but, and I forget what he told me that he had his name legally changed. He gave me some bullshit story. I go, but it's your car, right? He goes, oh yeah. I said, okay. I says, um, the ignition's punched and the radio's missing. I said, I'll tell you what, come up to the precinct tomorrow at 10 a.m., I says, but make sure you bring the title and all the paperwork and the insurance. You're making the insurance payments on it, right? Yeah, yeah. I go, you paying by check? Yeah. I go, bring me everything that you're paying the insurance. You paid the registration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bring me all the evidence. Yeah. Guy comes, and and it was funny because he comes into the precinct and he's got like a folder of stuff and he's handed it to me. I go, yeah, it's, it's, come on. And I walked him literally right into a jail cell and he's looking at me and he goes, (laughs) he goes, He goes, you didn't recover the car, did you? I go, well, I did, but I know it's not yours. And he goes, all right. He goes, well, I want a lawyer. I said, no problem. So lock him up. And then I start digging into his history, and I see that he sold another couple of Chevy Blazers. And uh, I think it was a Chevy Astro van, right? So I go, these cars are probably stolen too. Let's go take a look what these are, and we'll put more charges on them. And I'll never forget, the following week, a couple of days later, we go to this address in the Bronx, well, we go to this address in the Bronx. It's an apartment building. And in back of the building, they have like a little parking lot. And I see the car, this Chevy Astro van. So I'm like, oh, good. It's still here. We'll go up there and talk to the owner of the car. Who sold you this car? There's a problem with it, right? Sometimes people know. Sometimes they don't. We park. We go in front of the build. We're going up to the building. Who's standing in front of the building but the guy I locked up? He that day he was going there. Him and his friend were going to make that car disappear. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> so we got the car back and we recovered that car. It was stolen. And we wound up rearresting him again. He was just about to like maybe if I would have gotten there a half hour later, that it, car would have vanished. Oh yeah, they would have burned. Wait, these guys are creative. <laughs> yeah. You know, oh yeah. It's just you know like it's just. It, they're just off a little bit. Like if he had had the exact same vehicle, you know, then you wouldn't have noticed. That's true. You know, there's little things like that. They're, they're like, like, well, you're really close. Like your, your scam's pretty good. It's just a little, anything that's off that it'll just mess you up. And, and the third car I, I, I had to steal in the line of duty was, I locked up this kid with a, um, a BMW on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, had changed all the VIN numbers on it, and going through his history, I saw that he had sold or purchased one time this this Honda, 
same thing, big time salvage history. Um, I get a warrant for the car and the car is registered to someone out in Brooklyn. Same thing, fictitious person. So I figured, all right, let's do the same thing all over again. We'll steal the car off the street, have somebody report it stolen. So this time we didn't have a flatbed truck. We just had like a regular tow truck. Same thing, first thing in the morning, hook it up, no alarm, tow it off the street, take it through Brooklyn, through Manhattan, bring it up to our Bronx office. And, you know, I open the hood and the firewall's been changed and everything. And I get the hit on the car. It's reported stolen. So now we're taking everything that's out of the car and inventory in it. And I get into the trunk and I'll never forget there was a gap bag, you know, the blue ba- blue canvas bag, you know, with the string on it. And I'm squeezing the bag and I go, there's money in here. I just It just felt like money. And my partner goes, yeah, okay. I said, no, I think there's money in here. And I open it up. And I just see hundreds in bundles. Whoa. So we're looking at each other. And we start laughing, right? I go, he's retiring. And he was retiring in six months. And I think I was retiring in a year, right? We start laughing. I go, you know, if we were two other guys, like the guy that you had on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I said, I said, let's go. Let's go upstairs and give this to the lieutenant. So my lieutenant's sitting at his desk. And I think, I think it was 38,000. I think we go up there and I put it on his desk and he goes, what's this? With dirty, you know, it's money. And he goes, holy shit. So the NYPD, there's a whole procedure with seized money. You count it. You count it again. You run it through those money counters and everything. And then it goes for what's called asset forfeiture. So what you do is there's a unit in one, in one police plaza, and I can't think of the name of it, but they test the money for narcotics. Now, all money right. has touched narcotics at one time or another be it someone had weed in their pocket, someone rolled up a bill and snorted coke with it. All money has trace, tra- tra- trace amount of drugs on it. So what they do is they take, they take samples of the money. And I, I thought it was a joke. The guy comes out with this little shop vac and he plugs a chip into it. And I thought he was fucking around, but he was being dead serious. He goes, wave the money. What do you mean wave the money? He goes, just wave it. And as I'm moving it around, he's vacuuming it. And then they take that chip out of the shop vac and they plug it into a laptop or some kind of machine. And it shows parts per whatever. It shows like this this bill has been in contact with cocaine and hashish or whatever. So obviously the money tested positive for narcotics. So it's late. We're down to one police plaza with this bag full of money. And, and then we have it in these bank bags and you make what's called a night deposit. I think it was... Was it chemical or city bank? The city has a contract with one of the banks that you put it in a night deposit box, right? So we got all this money. We're going to go back up to the Bronx and drop this money off in a night deposit box. And there's three of us. And my sergeant, it was it was me and another detective. My sergeant, my sergeant goes, I'm hungry. I'm like, yeah, it's about midnight, but yeah, I'm hungry too. He goes, there was this Chinese restaurant. It was this hole in the wall. The address was 69 Bayard in Chinatown. And if you went in there, I don't know if it's still around, but if you Google it, you can see on the walls. If you went into it, it's like a little hole in the wall. But on the walls are dollar bills, like hundreds of dollar bills. People write on them and stuff. It, mm-hmm. It's just a, it's, it's a weird decor. So my sergeant goes, well, leave the money in the car. Or the other detective goes, leave the money in the car. and We'll get something to eat. I go, I'm not leaving that fucking money in the car. What are you kidding? I go, what if someone steals the car? Someone breaks into it. They're going to nail us on a cross. We're missing $38,000. So it's like that scene in Pulp Fiction when Jules and the other guy, they're in the diner with that suitcase with the gold shit in it. Yeah. We're sitting in 69 Bayard at 1230 at night with $38,000 at our feet eating Chinese food. And then we made we made the money drop. And nobody reported that car stolen. I think just before I retired, like a year or two later, someone actually reported that car stolen. And I gave that to it. I gave the case to another detective and I don't know what happened with it should call find out i'm retired 16 years 17 years <laughs> Paul, who? they're all god <clears throat> so how long did you work for that little police station in florida not long uh six or eight months oh how come why what i went from working in in, in america's largest police department doing auto theft and organized crime and then it was like working then being on an episode of reno 911 Right. You know, here I am in my 40s. I'm new guy, so I'm working midnights, rightfully so. And I'm drinking eight cups of coffee to stay up at night. 
And, you know, the game had passed me. So now I'm going on the domestics. I don't want to listen to people's problems at this point in my life in my 40s. The emphasis on DUIs down here in Florida, I mean, it, it just it, – they're all about the DUIs and it's like that was – there's no winning with drunks. They're yeah. either crying. They want to fight you. They're happy. They're pissing in the car. It just – the game had passed me by and it was time to do something else. And now I'm talking – I'd rather be talking to you than driving around in the middle of the night wrestling alligators or, or listening to domestic, domestic violence call. Okay. Well, I, I, I appreciate you, you know, doing this with me. Um, you really, about your, your channel, you, you got to start doing shorts. You got to figure out how to do shorts. Oh, I, I definitely am. Maybe I could come up there and uh, what do you use? What software do you use? Uh, well, um, Riverside FM. No, I've, I've done shorts before. I just didn't realize how, um, how effective they are. Yeah, they, they, they are. Cause, and you never know which one's going to suddenly get, you know, 200,000 views or a million views. You just don't know. So, you know, you post, you posted three a week and, you know, and, and they're fun. Once you get going, once you get doing them, they, they really, you know, you'll put an out. Listen, I could blow, I could, I could blow all day with doing two or three shorts and, and, and the whole day is gone. Next thing you know, you're like, oh my God, it's six o'clock at night. Like what's going on? I've been sitting here for twelve hours. Like this is insane. And they get a lot of uploads on YouTube. Yeah, the, if you okay. look at if you go to my channel and look at the shorts, I mean, I've got some of them have four or five million views. You know, most of them have five thousand, ten thousand, but I got tons of them that get fifty thousand, a hundred, two hundred, three hundred. Well, the one you and I did about Mike Tyson's motorcycle, I think it's up to like one point eight million. Right, right. I couldn't believe that. And that drives, you know, I don't know what, how much money that made, you know, you would think, okay, I mean, it doesn't matter because they're so short, but when it gets up there, it, it probably, it probably does have, uh, did make a lot of money. Oh wait, that's the wrong channel. I got, hold on. I got, oh man, just no good at this. Okay. I got these fat little fingers. <laughs> they're just, um, here it is. I, I hit the wrong button again. There it is. Okay, so watch. I can find out. I've got that shorts, and let's go by sort by most viewed. And yours is definitely. Oh yeah, yeah. Tyson's. Yeah, one point eight. It's one point eight, and I can tell you right now, it made how much money did that make? I mean, for like literally, it's what? It's like fifty seconds or something. Yeah. It's it's yeah one point eight, and it's got. It made two hundred and seventy-one dollars. <laughs> it's two hundred and seventy-one dollars. Nice right out. That's great. Like that. Like our payment. Listen, that's a that that right there. If I, I wish that each episode I did would make two hundred and seventy-one. That's great. But that's one of those things you have no idea. You don't know right. what, what it's going to do. Um, and it's funny that uh, Wade, which is a guy that runs a channel called um, uh, Crime and Entertainment. Yeah. yeah. He. You know, he does them now. He started off, he was doing like just really shitty ones. And I would call him up and I'd, he'd, go, he'd go, oh, what do you think of that one? I'd be like, I, I think it's horrible, bro. I think <laughs> you you didn't zoom in. You didn't do this. Well, how do I do that? And, you know, so we talked and he played with it. And probably within a week or two, he was sending me these shorts that I was like, wow. Like he really. I like Wade. He's a good dude. Yeah, he really did good. Like he's like, now he's doing like very professional ones. And he's like, yeah, he's like, I can see that where they'll they'll get they'll get some volume and he's and I can see they are driving uh, subscribers. So, but I, anything else? Are we good? You, you want to yeah, wrap um, it up? If I, if I may. Yeah. So my podcast, it's the same off. Fuck, it's NYPD through the looking glass podcast where I bring on retired NYPD members and we, you know, t tell store war stories. And there's a lot of funny stories from my books. Hey, I appreciate you guys watching. Do me a favor, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell. So you get notified of videos just like this. Also, please go to my, my clips channel and subscribe. It would really help me. And please consider joining my Patreon. It's $10 a month. All of Vic's links to his books or to Amazon and to, uh, to his channel, his YouTube channel and podcast in the description box. Thank you very much. See ya.